For the start of the outdoor tour here at the Michael Davitt Museum, we'll start with the end. Here lies the great man, died in 1906 in Dublin. He died following a visit to the dentist as one of his jobs in one of his prisons, Michael had to unpick oakum, which is thick cable, mainly in shipping or in ships. And because he only had the one arm, of course, he did most of that with his teeth. So all his life he suffered from gum disease and tooth decay. After yet another visit to the dentist, another infection set in, and then sepsis, or blood poisoning. Michael had said in his last will and testament that if he died in Ireland, then he would like to be buried in Strayed, County Mayo. His family home is about 300 yards, 400 yards, often in that direction, and his church and museum is now behind me. He's in there on his own. His wife, Mary Yaw, is buried in Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. Michael and Mary had lost a child to tuberculosis who had been buried in Glasnevin. Mary Yaw, the wife, wanted to be with the daughter. Michael's own family, his mother, his father, and his sisters, he had sent off to America before he was arrested for the first time, and they never returned. For company, Michael has his uncle and his aunt. Michael David spent the first four and a half years of his life here in Strayed, and indeed was buried in Strayed. His house, just a few hundred meters to the west, the penal church in which he was baptized and in which the museum is housed, and behind me in sight of Strayed Friary, one of the oldest friaries in Mayo. The story I'm about to tell you may or may not be completely true, but here lies the mortal remains of a man called Taig Doyle O'Higgin. The O'Higgins were a bardic family of poets, and the bards were the social influences of their day, the Kim Kardashians and Kanye Wests, and they would go to all the local houses and be wined and be dined, and their every need catered for. The story is that Taig Doyle went to one of the local houses, the O'Haras. He was wined, he was dined, and didn't particularly like the service he was given. The poem or song that he wrote was therefore really derogatory to the O'Haras. So incensed were they, they chased him out of the house. Tyke Doyle had to flee for his life, and where would you flee to? You'd flee to the friary to claim sanctuary. Tyke Doyle got as far as the friary wall where he was met by the Lord's men, slain and buried where he fell. So this is Strayed Friary, and we are standing in what would have been the cloisters. This is the south wall behind me. We had another wall running out that side and another wall running underneath what is now the penal church and enclosed at the back. This was where the monastic buildings were. So on one side we would have had the refectory, the dining area, the kitchens, and above that, the sleeping quarters. On this side would have been their chapter house, their cells, etc. All surrounded then by a wooden walkway, and we are in the middle of the cloisters. So, Straight Friary, built, completed by 1250 AD, some 770 years old, and therefore one of the oldest friaries in Mayo. Built of local limestone, 
in a Gothic architectural style. About three miles down the road towards Foxford and the River Moy is the castle of Jordan Dexeter. Jordan Dexeter was the Anglo-Norman Lord in charge of this area and he had this place built. We're standing in the nave. In front of me is the west window which would be impressive enough. But our magnificent east window is a wonderful example and one can imagine the morning sun streaming into the chancel and then streaming all the way down the nave. It was built for the Franciscan order, but within two years the Franciscans were kicked out and the Dominican order were moved in. Now that's highly unusual. Normally when an order gets established in a the place, they stay there. But on the insistence of a woman called Basilia de Myla Birmingham, she wanted the Franciscans out and the Dominicans in. Indeed, she said she would refuse all wifely duties until that happened. It duly happened. As we walk down the nave, we can see some of the Gothic architectural pieces like the Lancet windows. And before we head into the Holy of Holies, the chancel, just to make sure that the laity didn't mix with the religious, we had another arch coming over here to mirror the one behind me. In between the two arches and on top, of course, a little crenellated bell tower. And the religious would enter through this doorway. Uh, that is a doorway and they weren't all hobbits. The floor we're standing on is about three or four feet higher than it would have been. So we enter the chancel. We know we're entering a holy place because we have religious iconography to tell us. To my left, we have the symbol of an eagle. It's the symbol of St. John the Evangelist. We have another piece of medieval iconography. This is the pious pelican. Now I know it looks more like an eagle than the eagle, but it definitely is the pious pelican. The pelican was believed to gouge its own breast and draw blood to feed its young in times of want. Total nonsense, it never has and it never will, but that was the belief in medieval times and it became a symbol of Christ giving his blood for humanity. We also have the figure of a face, which is very Christ-like in our modern interpretation of Christ, but it probably refers back to St. John the Evangelist. So into the chancel. As I said before, it's in the Gothic style, so our lancet windows are a prime example of that. We know from the annals, the annals of Loch Key, the annals of the Four Masters, that the friary was burned twice. Once in 1252, which is really strange because that's exactly the year that the Dominican order came into the friary. The second time was in the 1430s, and the Pope at that time, Evgenius, said he would grant an indulgence to anyone who would help rebuild the friary. So as part of that 15th century restoration, we have a magnificent tomb frontal, depicting one, two, three, the three wise men with their gifts. Here we have Jesus, He's showing us the signs of the stigmata. A kneeling figure who's removing a hood or a hat, kneeling in front of a bishop. We know that from the mitre. This man we believe to be the patron of the restoration. He's wearing from his belt 
what we know to be a, a utensil, a tool called a weaver's shuttle, a tool used in weaving at the time. So this man was a local prosperous weaver. The last two figures we also know, they're both saints. The first one is carrying a key and a book. That has to be Saint Peter. The last figure is carrying a sword. That must be Saint Paul. Saint Paul was a Roman citizen and he couldn't be crucified, therefore, and killed with a sword. The same restoration gave us this. This is an altar reredos, the rear or the back of an altar. And here, surrounded by winged angels, we have the Pieta, Mary and Jesus down from the cross. Surrounded by two figures. This man is still wearing a weaver's shuttle. So immortalized in stone once and immortalized in stone twice, this is the same weaver. Must have had very deep pockets and presumably his wife. His pockets weren't quite deep enough though because the altar back was never finished. Now it may just be that the builders got a better offer and moved on to another friary. There were only a few master mason families entrusted with the building of large sites like these. Two shallow pools of water there is where the, the religious would wash their plates would wash their chalices, etc. And that hole in the wall may be the only access to a little hermitage. People who wanted to repent for their sins could volunteer to be bricked up in there and pass food and water through that hole for days, for weeks, for months, for years. This room here then shows the true level of the friary. So as I say, we're about four feet or so higher than we would have been. That is what we'd now call the sacristy. As I mentioned before, the friary was restored in the 1440s or so. As part of that restoration, this is the north transept added at that time. And that hole in the wall is where we believe the monument we saw in the chancel was originally housed. It certainly doesn't belong in the chancel because it's knocked out two of our lancet windows. So this part of the friary, about 1450. That's the tour of the Michael Davitt Museum over, the outside tour anyway. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope one day you'll experience it for real.